I think a lot of former British soldiers are coming to Ukraine because it's like a soldiers are treated better here. And it's a sense of purpose. Do they get a British humour? No. Ukrainians <laughs> don't understand sarcasm. They don't understand sarcasm at all. They don't really understand how smart Ukrainians are. It's not like a third world country if NATO was in this type of conflict. Would it last for two weeks at the scale at which Ukraine has lasted? No, they'd probably call a ceasefire and draw up a new border because they're not mentally prepped. The West ain't mentally prepped for this type of war. I don't think the West is mentally capable of full-scale war. The problem is these decision-makers in the West, they, uh, they've never been to war. They've never witnessed war. Um, if they, they come to Ukraine, they go to Kiev and they meet with someone. They don't go to the East. They don't see like the actual full scale of the damage. And same as the Americans, all these people in America and Europe arguing over ammunition shells. The longer they wait, like the more people are dying. And then it's going to be their children who are fighting. Hello, I'm Jenny Klochko, and today in Kiev I meet the International Legion fighter. He came from the UK. Uh, it's Anthony, and we have to cover Anthony's identity for the security reasons. Hello. How are you today? Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, good, thank you. I know you just came from the front line, from east, and so basically you from where it's very hot to the uh, peaceful, so to say, Kiev. How how do you feel? Uh, yeah, a complete change of scenery and environment. Uh, obviously, yeah, pretty much all I can say on that. How come the young man like yourself um, here in Ukraine, came from peaceful England, Britain, and uh, risking your life to defend a distant country? Uh, so, obviously, I uh, left the UK in 2020, moved abroad. Um, since 2021, I've been working uh, in Ukraine, working with Ukrainians, not in Ukraine, but working with Ukrainians and coming back and forward to Ukraine. Uh, obviously, when the full-scale invasion happened, uh, they were mobilised back into the military. Uh, and then obviously, around the start of the year, I came back, um, came to help them train on Western systems, uh, mainly Javelin and Law. Uh, I avoided the Legion like the plague, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, and then after a year of being in Ukraine and just working with Ukrainians, I decided to join the Legion. Um, obviously, I've got a child who's Ukrainian, so that's why I'm here. It was a difficult decision for you to make to go to the war because there's one thing to to feel sorry. There's the other thing to put your life at risk. No, I've been, obviously been doing the obviously been a soldier uh, my entire adult life, um, so it's a normal decision. Um, yeah. Did you discuss it with your family? There was uh, any hesitations from them? No, I don't really speak to them. I don't really, like, I've not seen my family. Uh, I don't really, obviously I joined the military at a very young age. Um, so I kind of have that disconnect from family. So my family are in Ukraine. Um, and so I'm still here. Okay. So did you, did you say you had a child? In yeah. Ukraine? How old is your child? Uh, young. Nine? No, no young. But, yeah. Oh, is it a girl or a boy? No, girl, but it's not really saying that. <laughs> is she still here? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned you've been in the army before, mm -hmm. but is there something you feel uh, somewhere you feel comfortable and you would like carry on being in the army, or it's just like time of life, you know, sort of like the adventurous part. And no, like, I left the army under circumstances. I obviously served, I served eight years, um, came from a conventional background, um, nothing fancy, conventional combat role. Um, and uh, so it's obviously 
with the UK. Um, there's no support network, network for soldiers. So we have a lot of problems with people with PTSD, a lot of homeless veterans living on the streets. Um, and that's because the, the government use soldiers like a commodity. So they take guys in it 16 or 15 in 10 months, um, make them swear allegiance to a country. And then once they're done with them, they kick them out like a um, piece of, I don't know, a used, a used tool. Uh, and that's why I have a lot of problem with veterans in prison. Um, so obviously when I left the military, I went straight back into a military job, uh, left the UK, obviously in 2020, I went straight into a military role abroad. Uh, and then that's how I ended up leading to Ukraine in 2021. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I think a lot of former British soldiers are coming to Ukraine because it's like a, soldiers are treated better here. And it's a sense of purpose. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Interesting you're saying, because from Ukrainian perspective here right now, there's only starting, hopefully, to develop a good industry for uh, ex-soldiers who can find themselves. And recently I've been speaking to the uh, representative of the veteran movement, and they do a big thing with Invictus Games and obviously other social support of the veterans. Do you think... Uh, the Invict or things like Invictus Games are very helpful, or it's very uh, for the very small number of people. I don't know. Like I, I, I can't comment on something like that. Um, I don't know. It, it helps. Like the the main thing is like people leave in the military and they need that sense of belonging still. Um, like I can. I know two people I speak to from the military from four years ago. You just, once you leave, you left, that's it. No one really stays in contact. Um, that's pretty much the nature of it. Uh, what did you know about Ukraine before you came here, before the full-scale invasion? And why was it Ukraine? Was it sort of by choice or by accident? Uh, no, so obviously I obviously used to work, work abroad, um, mainly around um, worked in Africa and 80% of the company was um, Ukrainians, former military. And we used to come to Ukraine for our weapon proficiency um, certificate and medical certification, um, first aid, obviously to stay current on the contract. Uh, and that's how I ended up coming to Ukraine for the first time. Was it difficult for you to get used to Ukraine? Because it's a post-Soviet country, a different culture, um, different way of thinking. Yeah, no, the the people are quite nice people. Um, and it's I don't know the the people are quite welcoming, uh, uh, welcoming. Um, yeah, it's I'm trying to think what's the word. It's, it's not you just need to obviously understand the culture. Um, or try to understand it. Um, but yeah. Do they get British humour? No. Ukrainians <laughs> don't understand sarcasm. They don't understand sarcasm at all. Do you educate them? Do you explain things about yeah, sarcasm? Yeah, still don't get it. No, yeah. <laughs> Is there something you can't get about Ukrainians? Uh, the sarcasm. So I don't understand the sarcasm or something. I just can't seem to... There's obviously British. Well, Americans can't understand sarcasm as well. The Brits are good at sarcasm. Um, something we're very good at. Do you have many Brits in your social circles? No. I only I only live with Ukrainians. I kind of... Um, I only work with Ukrainian units. Like, I live with Ukrainians and that's who I work with. I don't don't work with foreigners, any, any other foreigners anymore. Just... Um, I don't know, it's just kind of like a... You obviously you get foreigners who come over here, like, they come over here for a few months, then they go back. Um, obviously, I've not left. I stay here, I have nowhere to go. Um, and in my opinion, like, if you sign a contract with the military, you've got to hold yourself to the same standards as the Ukrainians. That's the only way you'll be taken serious. You've got to hold yourself to the same standards. You can't jump on a contract for three months, cancel it, go home for nine months, come back. Like, you can't use this reality as somewhere to fulfill your fantasies you didn't get in the military. Um, it's kind of where I 
differentiate with other foreigners. Like, don't get me wrong, there's foreigners out here. There's some really good foreigners out here who are doing great work. Um, not just kinetic, as in fighting, but medical, um, instructing, logistics. Um, and they're the people there for the right reasons. And you get another group of foreigners who, it, it, this is like a holiday camp for them. Um, that's my 10 pence on that. Interesting. It's uh, not the picture I imagine because I thought uh, even being within International Legion, the, the foreigners grouped together or the people from the same part of the world getting together because, you know, there's people you can get and they understand you. See, this is a problem. Um, obviously, when you clot people together, they don't learn the culture or the language. And then how can a unit operate on a position if it can't communicate with the unit left and right to it because it doesn't speak Ukrainian. Um, the most like the most important thing for foreigners, in my opinion, is um, force force multiplication. So, if you've got military experience, passing that on to the Ukrainians in a way, obviously um, training Ukrainian soldiers um, or using your knowledge to make the the force stronger. Um, too many foreigners are creating these special mission units that don't really do anything. Um, you can have all the Navy SEALs, Rangers, SAS you want. Um, an artillery shell will soon get rid of them. So what's the point in having all that knowledge together when you could divide it across across the force and actually up the level of it? That's my opinion on it. What's your role in the Army? Uh, currently I'm... Um, so I've moved away from... I'll explain it. Kind of like a training assist at the moment. Went from so we um, attach to a unit, um, train them uh, by the line, and then deploy them on operations, uh, supporting that way. I, I learned very early on from past missions that foreigners all going out together um, doesn't really work. It doesn't work. You don't have big effect. It's better working with the Ukrainians and up in the level, learning how people work and then deploying together uh, rather than just turning up. What's the average um, age among the people you are with, Siren with? Well, among the foreigners or Ukrainians? Is it different? Yeah. Hmm. Foreigners? It, 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 differs from, it differs from units. So you look at some of the... The stronger units, um, the units which are having the most effect on the line, they're mainly made up of volunteers because they want to fight. Um, obviously, Third Assault Brigade is mainly made up of volunteers and their demographic is younger guys. That's why they're having such effect because they're made by... they're full of motivated people. Um, and then if you look at other units which have them mobilized, the older generation, they still want to fight, but you can't do much with them because they're a lot older. Um, now you look at the foreigners, it's a different... You look at the foreign ages, it's anything from 18 years of age to 61 years of age, and then everything in between. Um, so, yeah. Uh, speaking to the British officers in the UK, and they... Um wondering and saying this usually war is the job for young people mm -hmm. and in ukraine when you see in media there are a lot of mature men and uh, in some interviews you can hear that they prove to be more effective or stronger w what's your experience yes yeah, so th this is something like um we've talked about i've talked about with a lot of people about it like you got to, these people have a lot of life experience. Um, a lot of them were builders, or well, Ukraine used to have conscription anyway, so they've already got some sort of basic military training. Even if it was Soviet, um, they understand how to handle an AK. Um, but then they've got life experience; they know how to fix cars. Some of them are engineers or builders, so and they're not stupid. Like this is like the problem with the media is because the West was so tied up in Afghan for twenty years that they think everyone who isn't part of NATO operates like an Afghan. Um, that's why if you look at the start of the war, um, 
And people are saying, oh, Keeve would fall in two weeks because they've seen it happen with Cobol. They, they don't understand, obviously, the culture. Um, trying to think where I was going with this. Um, but yeah, they, they, they don't really understand how smart Ukrainians are. It's not like a third world country. Like I've worked with Africans and like, this isn't like we're training Africans or working alongside Africans. This is working with professional people who they're not stupid. Um, the one thing that annoys me about the Western media as well, they like paint the Ukrainian soldiers as like pity, pity, like they're all sat there crying. That's, that's not the case. Um, that's something that gets under my skin massively. Like the Western media should paint the Ukrainians in a way that like they're doing a job that NATO can't do. And no matter if they're 50 years of age or 18 years of age, they're, they're still doing a job that NATO can't do. Uh, when the full-scale invasion happened, where you've been? I was in I was in Africa at the time, and then obviously, because um, I was with Ukrainians when we were in Africa, and we were saying, "Oh, it's not going to happen." Everyone was saying they were saying it's not going to happen, and then it happened, and then it was a whole process of getting people back. So, did you when you uh, got back? Have you been uh, part of the battle for Kiev, or you were sent to the east? No, I was. Uh, no, I wasn't uh, in Kiev at the time. Some different parts. Yeah. Obviously, war comes with uh, with lots of loss. And how do you go through the losing your comrades, or sort of is there mechanism on the way to protect you because you have to keep yourself in certain state? You can't let yourself go upset. I know. I uh, talked to uh, one of the commanders, and he was in Kharkiv at the when the, the full scale invasion happened, and obviously he he lost lots of guys. And I asked him how he's dealing. He says, "Well, I got to the point when I can't go to the funeral anymore. It's just it's it's the most difficult, the most heartbreaking, and for me to carry on with my job, I I have to." I have to stop doing it. How about you? Well, um, don't really. Um, you just need to keep going. Like, um, obviously, there's a there's a different. Like, this is where I compare it to the Ukrainians and the foreigners. Here. The foreigners lose someone, and they go into mourning, and they go home, and they all have me mental breakdowns, and PTSD hits them and they enter a state of mourning for six weeks, and then the families get loads of money because a foreigner died. Ukrainians lose someone. They have one day for a funeral and they're back on the line. They haven't got time to grieve. This is why I've distanced myself from the other foreigners because they're not holding themselves to the same standards as the Ukrainians, and they want better treatment. When you're in the combat zone, like you've been several hours ago, and you were brought here to Kiev for us to meet and have this conversation. I hear this from other uh, servicemen and I notice myself when I come from London and mentally are prepared to go into the war. But Kiev, most of the time, if there's no air raid signals or there's no shelling, it seems like absolutely um, peaceful place. And uh, there are lots of people uh, who seems like uh, they're manifesting the, the war is not here or it's we we have a normal life is this something bothers you or strikes you you know with this disconnection in a way yeah they need to get a grip like they don't realize like there's a lot of people hiding from the, this war world if they, one way or another it's going to find them um there's like there's there's ukrainian men who are hiding in england like It's a joke. Like the these same people who are driving around Kiev and their expensive land cruisers will be the first ones when like this war's done on the parade. They just I don't know the I don't know they're a parasite. The everyone needs to play their part. Um, don't get me wrong. I understand like oh showing defiance in that, but. Some people are just taking the uh, 
taking it advantage of it. Um, don't know what really to say to that. As a foreigner, it does frustrate me that I'm in this country. Well, obviously, it's a choice of my own, but and then you get fighting age men who are hiding. Do you have any sentiments uh, about Russians? No. As a Ukrainian, obviously, I have my set of emotions, my own perception. But for you, it's probably as a military person, and uh, for you, it's you're more prepared for for these circumstances. But there's, I don't know, is there any psychological barrier dealing with them? I'm sure you came across of them on the battlefield, or you know, maybe taking prisoners. Is the any experience you had with them and what kind of emotions you had? You've always got to respect your enemy, but they need cleansing. Like, they need cleansing from the land. Um, the war won't be over until they've been completely eradicated. Um, don't get me wrong, there's, that's not me speaking about, obviously, Russians in general. Like, there's Russians who are fighting for Ukraine. We've got Russians who work with us who are... They're good Russians, but... The ones who are supporting this war, they need cleansing. Is it a strong enemy, uh, Russians? Are they? Because I remember at the beginning of the war, there was lots of. I understand that we should have uh, war propaganda, but there were like you know silly enemy, you know, not fully equipped or doing silly, foolish uh, decision. How about now? R uh, they're not stupid. Like this is the thing. Like people make out that it's a, it's a paper tiger. Um, the Russians have some very good units. Um, obviously, you can say you got to respect. You got to respect the enemy. They have good units. It's like anywhere, any military has bad units and has good units. Um, it's pretty much all that I can say on it. Like if you look at Wagner, they they're a different animal. A um, lot of like there's a lot of like how they conduct themselves are professional. Obviously you have like the the meat wave prisoners when they obviously when Wagner existed uh, around Batmouth, but then they have like the professional soldiers who fought in Syria, um and the likes of Africa. So the there are good units there and there are good I would say good, like professional. Did you come across Wagner fighters? Came across them before, yeah. Yeah. We're was is a big difference between them a and regular army. Did you come across those who were employed from the prisons? Yeah, on the professional. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know if I can really say this. Um, obviously, prior prior to the obviously full scale invasion, uh, the company we were working with had former Wagner in it. Um, so I know Serbian guys who were former Wagner, personally. Uh, I'm from working with Serbians, they're professional soldiers. So when people talk about Russians and, uh, and the media portrays them as this clown army, they do have very professional elements in there. Um, something the West need to realize. Uh, because I think we, we call Russia a paper tiger, but then NATO needs to look at itself in the mirror. If NATO was in this type of conflict, um, uh, NATO was in this type of conflict. Would it last for two weeks at the scale at which Ukraine has lasted? No, they'd probably call a ceasefire and draw up a new border because they're not mentally prepped. The West ain't mentally prepped for this type of war. The West has became too woke and weak. It's a floppy mess. We're, we couldn't... Like, we, the NATO did 20 years, or the UK and America did 20 years in Afghanistan, and cried over a very small portion of people dying on the grand scale of things. Like, f f around 450 British soldiers died in Afghanistan. That's nothing compared to what's happening there. Um, I don't think the West is mentally capable of full-scale war. Or Western society. Ukraine relies on the ammunition supply and other aid from the Western partners. And um, 
Do you feel, uh, because there's, in the Ukrainian media there's a lot of speculation, there's uh, uh, Ukrainian units uh, were given order to be careful with usage of ammunition or something. Is there something you experience? Or units? No, no. The, the, obviously, like not damage in operational security. That is, like, it's obviously it's very well known in the media about obviously the ammunition situation. Um, yeah, I've came across it. Like, um, not it's not down to personal ammunition, but it's artillery. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't fight a war without artillery, and the Russians have a lot of it. Um, and the problem is these decision makers in the West. They, uh, they've never been to war. They've never witnessed war. Um, if they, they come to Ukraine, they go to Kiev and they meet with someone. They don't go to the east. They don't see like the actual full scale of the damage. And same as the Americans, all these people in America and Europe arguing over ammunition shells. The longer they wait, like the more people are dying. And then it's going to be their children who are fighting. Do you have... I understand. No, I think I imagine, I can imagine the um, routine or the, the circumstances you're working. So you have to be in the right state of mind, physical ability, all of that. Is there any little things that you do for yourself to have positive emotions or some maybe some rituals for good luck or maybe call with the people who are dear to your heart or is there anything, you know, it's just we do... Um, each of us do in our lives to make our day better? Yeah, I just keep working. Like, if you stop working, that's when you get depressed. Um, like, I don't like being in Kiev, I like to be working. Um, if you stop to think about it, that's when you start getting upset. You just need to keep working. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, so, I understand uh, you don't miss anything about UK. No. It's not something you, you you don't belong to those people who go abroad, take uh, baked beans, cup of tea, and looking for the places with fish and chips. Nah, like I don't know, British people are. That's a problem. I don't know. I just don't really like. Well, okay. If I mentioned food, is there any favorite of Ukrainian food that's like became your comfort food? Uh, borscht. Borscht is nice. Borscht. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Do you plan for the future? Do no. you have dreams? Something, you know, after the war or after the victory? I uh, don't know. Live here. Probably go back to work somewhere else. I plan to stay in Ukraine. How do you imagine a victory? That when all the lands reclaimed. You can't, you can't do a ceasefire, you can't have peace talks with these people. Is there something you would like to say to the British people? Get a grip. Like, too many, I don't know. With the, with the UK, is like, they don't have a clue about anything. Like, they live in a bubble, live on an island. Um, even the people, like, I serve in the military, um, live in this constructed shell. Um, they don't. They don't know what reality is. Um, like I know the the UK were talking about mobilisation and mobilising British people. Like prepare for that. You think they will yeah. come into the UK? The, something's gonna like the people need to be mentally prepared. Like the UK is just like, like look at the British Army. It can't recruit. It can't recruit people can't recruit people it does it never meets its quota for numbers um and that's because like the generations now they're obsessed with like love island and h&m clothing line and bullshit like it's not going to help you they're all consumerist you know consumerist ideas and they know they don't understand reality in my opinion on it Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Uh, today in Kiev I talked to International Legion uh, fighter in Ukraine. Um, I introduced him as Anthony.
Uh, we agreed on this name. It's not his real name, but for the security reason, we have to protect his identity. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget uh, to like, share, subscribe, and share your thoughts with me. Thank you.